Um, do, do you hear me well? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, well, uh, yesterday I, I was told that I've got catchy titles. That's why people come here. Uh, and yesterday I, I ran a workshop with a catchy title. So I hope uh, this lecture will be much more than a catchy title for you. Um, I'm Pavel, I'm UX and service designer, working since 2018, uh, 2008, sorry, I'm older. <laughs> I'm running my own consultancy, it's a collective of designers, artists and programmers. We are doing um, mostly design and research work. I'm also the founder of World Disability Day Silesia Conference. And today I want to share with you some of my observations, thoughts, insights regarding planning and methods and frameworks, processes and approaches in design field. Um, and it's not about showing the superiority of one method over the other methods. Uh, it's usually based on the false dichotomy. Uh, it's planned for 25 minutes, so I'll not exhaust this topic. Uh, it's based on my experience, but also on teachings from my mentors and, and teachers. So um, there's a whole body of knowledge. It's not my invention, what I will tell you. It's rather um, a kind of compilation of things that I'm thinking about. And it's an invitation for you for a generative dialogue. I don't like to debate and prove that I'm right or someone is wrong. It's rather just to open minds of yours, of mine, and, and to, to talk. So let me start with methods and processes in general. Uh, so probably all of you know dozens, hundreds of methods and processes that help you to deal with project complexities. Maybe you are familiar with some of these diagrams, or maybe these diagrams and canvas, or maybe these diagrams and canvas. But what does it mean to know the method, to why we use the method at all? All I know about methods is that when I'm not working, I sometimes think I know something. But when I'm working, it is quite clear I know nothing. It's John Cage from his lecture on nothing. Uh, visual representation of the method is not the experience of using the method. So there is a distinction between what the method is, what I think about the method, and how I use the method, and what is my experience using regarding it. So why methods? Why, why, why they are important? So they help us to deal with complexity. They are re reducing cognitive load, so simplifying complex problems to simplified model. They are suggesting some logical series of steps and principles, heuristics. Um, they give us the sense of understanding. And also they help us to opera operationalize project plans and intuitions. And in in a given context, every method can lead to success or to failure. At least we can blame the method for it, because there is, uh, it's, an, it's impossible to um, find all the success and failure factors when we do something. And that's, I think, the only thing during this lecture which I'm 100% sure. Um, there is no one single method that works every time and in every circumstances. And all methods are context-dependent. I will follow it later. And some methods help us to see a big picture. And some of them, they are designed to focus on details. Big points apply eye, small points apply hand. It's a Chinese proverb, which we can also explain us that we need eyes and some big pictures to see um, the complexity, the, the system, and also we need some tools that we can use to, to, to do, deal with the details, and both are important because we have eyes and hands. But uh, focusing only on big picture is risky. 
and at the same time focusing on details without seeing big pictures sounds like asking for troubles. So when I was preparing this lecture, I asked some questions to myself, and also I would like to leave these questions for you. Maybe you will find some answers or hints during my lecture. So how to balance between different levels of details? Is big picture a picture of reality or it's a reality? Um, how to balance the complexity of methods to not oversimplify or overcomplicate them? Um, there is a very nice quote um, that every complex problem has an answer which is easy, simple and wrong. Uh, how to choose the right method at the right time when methods are enablers and when they are constraint setters? What are the limitations of methods? And during this talk, I would like to go through three different perspectives on design and more general management and address some of these questions and also show or maybe some new questions will rise. Maybe we'll have some new questions. So um, let's start with user-centered design, which I also call anyone-centered design or anything-centered design. Probably all of you are familiar with this model. So it's uh, quite obvious, but in the same time, it's quite oversimplistic because we are putting attention on one stakeholder in expense of the other stakeholders. So we are focusing our attention on the user or on the client, on the customer. So what about the rest? Some of you may be familiar with this model. Um, it's like more complex representation of user-centered design. Um, and it's more systemic because we don't have only users' needs, but also some technological constraints and possibilities and business goals. So we've got three stakeholders here. But uh, user-centered design is reductionist in the sense that also it reduces the human into one role of the user. So it's not so... Um, humanistic in nature. So the centrism, what I call it, is in my opinion oversimplistic as a model, but can be useful as a method. Uh, some um, views on, on this model. It's oversimplified. It can help to meet some predefined success criteria. It brings some practical empathy to design process. I'm not sure about the real empathy. It helps to find insight and that leads to new decisions and directions. Unfortunately, in many cases, in my experience, it's not about user, it's more about money. It helps to focus uh, in details on the one important stakeholder, that's a good part. It ha sometimes helps to balance user needs with business goals, that's what I mentioned before. And it ignores all other stakeholders and many significant factors in product life cycle that often leads to problem displacement. So if you are familiar with uh, our current crisis, with trash, with climate, um, it's uh, a little bit connected with the centric approach where, where we see our sac client's success without thinking what set of problems we displace, we, we move to others. And with every problem we solve, we create new problems, which creates niche for new solutions, and these solutions create niches for new problems. And it's uh, the chain of problems creation. So please take a moment and think about tools and methods that are based on this centric approach that you use. There's another perspective. Um, it's systems thinking perspective. There, there, there were some lectures already on it. Um, in this approach, we put stakeholders into the game. Not only one stakeholder, but many. Stakeholder can be anything or anyone who can influence the system and is influenced by the system. It's uh, Tom Gilb's uh, definition. Tom uh, made a great work during recent race on stakeholders engineering. So we move from this model into a model which looks more like this. We see stakeholders with some connections and interactions between them. 
stakeholders have attributes like needs, values, resources, and so on and so on. Um, this model is a little bit mechanistic because systems thinking reduces the complexity into input process, output feedback loops, and uh, we uh, mm, can explain a lot of uh, phenomena and uh, a lot of systems using this model, but sometimes it also causes problems. We've got casual loops, if you are more familiar with systems dynamics. Um, we can observe how adding new mm, components to the system changes the behavior of some stakeholders and it changes behavior of another stakeholders. So this approach for sure helps to see the big picture. There is no one key stakeholder, but whole network of stakeholders and interactions. Uh, we can operationalize this approach, and I really recommend you uh, Tom Gilp's uh, Evo method. It's an agile uh, in a pure sense. Um, it also allows to consider um, values and costs uh, of design interventions. Mm. So, also Gilp's reference here, impact estimation table, it works pretty well. And, of course, there are some risks, and uh, the risk is that the model can be mistaken with the reality. As one of my favorite authors wrote, you've mistaken the stars reflected on the surface of the lake at night for heavens. So sometimes we are so focused on modeling and seeing models that we forget that the uh, map is not the territory. So another risk of system thinking modeling is the limitation of the model. So we've got boundaries, which are very useful in the models like this, but sometimes we can uh, go too far with the boundaries and, and modeling, and we are starting creating silos. So we've got the system with the boundaries, because we need to put some boundaries when we are modeling. But uh, the risk is that we'll forget about the environment around the system. And in open systems, there is always exchange of information and energy between stakeholders, which are not included in our models. So that's uh, a complex problem. So please take a moment and think about methods and processes that use this systems thinking approach. Any ideas, hints? I think this business model canvas is a very systemic tool. Simple, but, but it involves more, more perspectives. So maybe there are other ways of making sense of the world. And uh, it's complexity thinking. I, I'm new to this field a couple of years already. Um, when talking about complexity, I would like to start with the Canadian framework uh, by Dave Snowden and Cognitive Edge. So this, this framework allows us to um, sense uh, what uh, domain we are, what, the, what is the context of the pro project. Um, we've got uh, four, five domains here, clear, complicated, and complex, chaotic, and disorder. The clear uh, domain is uh, where we can sense, categorize, and respond. It's, it's uh, um, the domain of the problem, or the, uh, the problems where um, it's uh, easy to find uh, the causal relationships between things, and we can use best practices, and uh, it's quite simple to solve problems from, from this clear domain. But we've got also complicated domain, um, which is still ordered, but requires uh, experts to, to help. And in many projects, which uh, I believe most of you are involved, you are asked to, to solve some, some issues that company can't solve uh, by themselves, companies can't solve by, by themselves, but you've got the expert knowledge. Imagine uh, fixing a car. Me as a driver, I can't fix a car, but I can go to the specialist who can fix the car for me. So for me, it's completely insane how to fix a car, but for the experts, it, it works. He, he knows how to analyze the problem and, and find the, 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 the right response for it. But in the complex domain, we've got completely different behavior of the system. It's not deterministic. We can't predict what will happen. Um, there are 
no causal relationships that we can observe. We can only retrospectively um, see uh, if there are some causality in the systems like this. Um, to explain complex system, please um, imagine how tough is to um, uh, right, uh, how, to, how tough is to um, ra raise a kid, um, uh, being a f parent. It's something that you can't have a book about it. It's it's something very complex, which you have um, probe, sense, and respond. While systems thinking methods work well in clear and complicated domains, so in this ordered part, um, it can be challenged in complex domain. So some characteristics of complex systems, uh, they consist of a large number of elements that in themselves can be simple. Interactions between elements are no linear, uh, they are open systems, uh, they are not deterministic, so for example the phenomena of emergence can appear and they are adaptive. Emergence, appearance of something, typically a property as a result of the interactions, of parts in the system in a way that in the, it is not predictable, starting from the analysis of those parts. So we can't uh, decompose the systems into smaller parts and try to predict the behavior of the system as a whole. Some examples of emergence, for sure you have seen this beautiful view uh, uh, so, 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 sometimes. And uh, birds are observing their neighbor, neighbors how these neighbors behave so they can create a flock. In nature, there are a lot of emergence because nature, nature is not something that we can design. Um, humans and societies, neighborhoods, how people collectively work without planning, with, with, with they are self-organized. How, how, how do they self-organize? We um, can see a lot of... Uh, bottom-up initiatives that are not planned, which are spontaneous, uh, which emerge during crisis. What happened uh, in, in, after Russian aggression, how, how Polish families uh, responded to, to it. It wasn't planned, it was emergent. Um, also technology is emergent. New things emerge. Um, there are gamers who create modes. Uh, there are online communities who makes things that are novel, which are new, which are emergent in nature. Emergence occurs through self-organizing systems in which individual agents interact, learn and adapt to environmental focus to the point at which a new or modified system is created to meet the new demands of the environment. It is unplanned, not predictable, and occurs at the right time when conditions are right. So emergence um, occurs at the right moment, and the right context. And it's, uh, there are more and more phenomena connected with it. It's exaptation, for example, how uh, we find as a species or other species find new uh, purposes for the things they use. For example, um, birds who have... Um, uh, what have birds? Feather, yeah, so feather um, was to make the bird uh, feel warmer and it evolved into wings. So designing for change, and I think I'm going to the point of my lecture. Um, design is an intentional and goal-oriented activity that leads to change. That's what I do for a living. If there are limits to what we can know, then there are, of course, limits to what we can achieve in a predetermined, planned way. So we've got knowledge limits. We sometimes deal with complex systems which are not deterministic. So we can't design in the systems in the way we want, because we will not, we don't know what will happen. So not every change is done by design and intervention. Um, I believe that in complex systems we are triggering change, not design change. And the change is happening during interaction of components of, of stakeholders of the system. 
So in complex systems, um, I believe the role of designer is more often to design triggers than to design change. It's to scaffold change, to facilitate change, to observe change, to detect weak signals in the behavior of the system, not to design the change itself. Stuart Kaufman, who is the author of Emergence Idea, uh, said that dip in the chaotic regime, slight changes in structure almost always cause vast changes in behavior. Complex, controllable behavior seems precluded. So even micro changes can lead to big transformations. So something starting happening in the micro scale and it can be very transformative and it's not designed. So which methods, which perspective, big pictures, details, what? Uh, this is the last chapter. Um, it's uh, what I believe, um, that designing in the complex and for the complex world requires the ability to switch between different perspectives. And my, my working title is the pulsating awareness. So we have to have this feeling which can help us to sense where are we. We can use Canadian framework, for example, to, to help ourselves. And what we need to feel, we have to have this intuition, which methods we should use, not to um, choose the methods we like most, rather to choose the methods which, which are the most appropriated in the given system. Uh, all methods can be useful, but they show only a part of truth and also they sometimes quite troublemaking. And uh, we don't know in which context we operate, uh, when we don't know in which context we operate, uh, methods can be misleading. That's why I also reference here to Canadian. Top-down planning is important, so all these systemic changes. But we can't forget about bottom-up initiatives and phenomena that are spontaneous and, and can't be predicted. So as designers, it's also a very important lesson for, for us to remember. And complex city science opens new opportunities for designers and for, for the whole community to develop new ways of thinking, of doing, of practicing design. But are we ready? to question user-centered design, systems thinking approach, and go beyond these uh, approaches of, of working. So some questions that I've got for the discussion is how often does designers' education go beyond these um, two models? Uh, how to develop new tools? There are tools. Um, and Pedental Julian, for example, she is uh, author of, of tools which are very powerful in complex um, domain. And sometimes there are some disciplines which are more open for emergence and some disciplines that demand rigorous design, planned, validated in advance. So, of course, not everywhere, not everything. So these are the questions for you. If you have any questions to me, I'm open. Thank you. Thank you. Got second day of the conference and I still didn't figure out how the mic works, sorry. <laughs> so, any questions? <laughs>